Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So two years ago, we had the opportunity to present also at this forum. Um, we had just constructed the project. We had very initial data and um, the presentation, let me just take you back to this. The presentation was really focused on the design of the project, the logistics, how to get um, the product from Germany all the way to the Northwest Territories. Um, the innovation that went with the project, there was a whole shopping list of innovations that we did in-house. That was the focus of that presentation. Um, the question then posed for this presentation was, so how is it performing? Um, at that stage, it was like a wow project, uh, you, quite a gutsy approach to <laughs> install this type of uh, solution in an area where it was totally untested um, and for us to move on that. Um, and, and we had a lot of skeptics uh, standing on the side and, and uh, logically can be skeptical about a project like this. And so the question I always get is, but how is it doing? Is it surviving? Is it doing well? or not, and so today's presentation is to take you through the data. And I can tell you honestly, I wouldn't be here um, if the project wasn't doing well, I'll be hiding somewhere <laughs> underground um, off the radar. So, so just by being here is, is already um, a, a vote of confidence. So uh, it seems that this session is really about the remote part, Northwest Territories up there where the red dots are, um, in the far, far north, uh, that comes with its, all, its, its own challenges. But it's a, it's a beautiful part of the world. We mine uh, exquisite, uh, pure white diamonds there um, as part of the Rio Tinto operation. We also share that area with um, Dominion Diamonds, and De Beers also mining that area. Um, and so we all share the similar challenges. One of the challenges, um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because I did that two years ago, but we are very remote. I'll just go to how remote. <laughs> um, you won't see a transmission line on that picture. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, the roads are very seasonal. This is a little bit up close. Um, it's, it's quite pristine, it's quite beautiful, but it's, I, I think it passes the sniff test on remoteness. Um, that's winter. You can see the roads there are the seasonal winter road that melts in summer. So that's our, that's our summer picture. Um, I'm jumping around. I'm just going back to um, what is Divey Diamond Mine. It's part of the Rio Tinto suite. We are extremely safe mine, very proud mine. We, we've been um, operating open pit mines. We're constructing our third open pit as we speak. But currently, we are an all underground mine. Um, and we have a very interesting energy load profile that goes um, with being an underground mine in the north. So I'm going to ask that the video gets played now. I'll just put together a, a short video, no sound. I'm just going to talk you a little bit through the mine. Um, this is our all-season winter road. Why I want to show you this is just get a sense of the context we are operating in um, and why having gone for a renewable project is, is, a, is a tough goal. I can also say that we didn't install this project because we green uh, per se, or that we wanted to have a social project. This project was built solely on economics, A, B, operational stability, and C, de-risking our energy profile. So here we're doing a flyby over the one pit. There you can see the second one. We're entering our tailings facility. Um, a lot of energy is spent on, on heating. This is our summer look. Uh, heating and um, pumping. We, our diamonds have decided to position themselves all underneath the water. So we've got a pump, uh, first dike, and then pump all this water out. Um, currently, we are underneath. You can see our, our mines there. That's a sub-level retreat type of mining. And there in the background, you can see our four 2.3 megawatt in her con direct drive turbines operating and beautifully turning. So that just gives you a, a little bit of a sense of, of our mine. Um, our big loads as we are underground, pumping obviously, underground ventilation and, um, and heating. 
So the project started in June 2010. It was operational September 2012. And you can do it that fast. We, uh, we bought 9.2 megawatt, but we're getting 9.4 at the moment. I think the Enercon gave us a few extra copper strands on each of those generators. But we, we're getting easily 2.4 megawatts on those turbines. And um, you know, just digging into the data, on average, every single month, we pull 2.4 megawatts per turbine consistently. Um, average power penetration, 11%. That's the amount of diesel being offset. I'm not a big fan of average, but I'm going to give you average data just because there's so much data, and it's, I'm giving you a three-year view on data. The, the maximum penetration, 56%. And, and our, grid is, um, our grid system is manually operated. It's not an automatic system. We have about 48 megawatt of Caterpillar diesel generators, and this augments that, and up to 56% uh, penetration with a manual operated energy management system. The initial NPV model, um, I remember building the model with having absolutely no data. Um, uh, but, but we got pretty close to it. But so far, we got about 56 gigawatt hours over three years, pretty good. Um, and the diesel savings there, uh, we, we can fund a lot of capital with, with that saving. I think also on the picture, you can see um, the project has passed the all-weather sniff test. That's the other thing of the, of the risk profile of a project like this is um, there's not a lot of data in our operating conditions on turbines of, of these type. Um, and I think the data I'm going to show you is I, I think Enocon now has, and as well as the North, uh, projects of these size, typically how, how survivable is, is the technology. So the turbine availability is a key piece to your, to your uh, cost-saving um, so uh, W is, is, is turbine one to turbine four. And you can see our first winter. Of course, it was one of the coldest winters on record in 20 years. That's just when we commissioned in the plant. So, so we got a, a proper taste of what, what's the, the weakness in the system. You can see our plant availability on all four turbines dropped rock bottom. And that's where we were on an extremely steep learning curve. But sustaining it forward, um, the, our plant availabilities have all been in, in the 90s and high 90s. Um, so so that, that's a key learning. The rate bars are what was put in the NPV model per annum. You can see there the kilowatt hours are systematically, you know, the plan was 50 gigawatt hours. We're sitting at 55 gigawatt hours um, of achieved um, energy extracted, that, that's an extremely positive story. Also, if you look at the gradient of that line, it's very consistent, very consistent. You can actually see where it actually levels off um, is that first winter where we lost a lot of availability, so it has a direct impact on your kilowatt hours. Also on the bottom chart, the key thing there, over three years, the four turbines being in four different locations have been consistently performing similar, you know, that, that is not a mute point. It is um, the, the dynamics around each one of them, you know, the, the wind, the wind shadow that we talk about, our one turbine is right next to the, the tailings dam wall, which creates certain vortex, and we were concerned how that's going to impact. So, but you can see quite sustainable uh, performance across all four. Again, these are averages, so but I think it tells the story. Uh, the other thing is load factor or capacity factor out of a 2.3 megawatt, 2.4 megawatt unit. How much power do you actually ex extract? Um, and uh, one of the things there is the capacity factors are pretty good. They, uh, you know, they're not below industry standard. They're there, and in some cases we, we, we slightly above. And the other thing is knowing when you drop below your capacity factor, i.e. how much value did, do you get out of the turbine. The bottom you can see directly correlated to wind speed. Obviously, that, that's a logical thing. But what we've seen is the performance of these turbines, the data accuracy is impacted whether it's on or off. And so um, it's understanding your data, where we have that dips in, in wind speed data is not necessarily where the wind was low. We've learned that when the turbines are not running in a certain 
method, the, the wind speed data is actually skewed. So, so that was another uh, key piece of, of learning for us. A quick case study here. So this is five minute data. Um, I call this uh, the lethal spy eye. I'll just dial in on, on my Excel spreadsheet and see how the control room operators are managing the system and if they're getting maximum out. And the key thing for me is are they loading the maximum set point that they can, because we want to we want to get out of that asset as much as we can. So when they load a set point, a power extraction set point that's too conservative, they'll, they'll, they'll tend to get a call. It's lift the set point. So in this case, the set point is above 9.2 megawatt, which is correct. Um, and uh, so so the far left is is the most recent. Going to the right is is the you know is in time. Um, and the, the thing here, uh, again, is understanding your data, is the wind direction is very interesting. Uh, certain wind directions, when it hits that wind direction, specifically southeast, you can switch off a generator because your load profile is going to be consistent and it's going to be consistent for hours. When it comes from the north, northwest, it's going to have a high volatility and you're going to plan for high spinning reserve on your system. These are things that you learn with time. So you start to make a correlation. Where's the wind coming from? And can you start planning for shutting down gen sets? And that's where the true, true energy savings or diesel savings come from. The other thing that you can see, I sneaked in two pictures of our mind there just to keep it energy in mind. The, the other top graph there is our south over eight line. So we have a dual reticulation system, north and south over eight line. Once the wind runs, so this data here running from about 5.5 to 9.2 megawatts, once it runs, you need to know what it's doing to your load on your lines because it's doing a straight offset. And you can see there in the negative territory where you have a reverse power profile. It sounds complex. It is not complex. Most of these things are actually really straightforward. Um, and, and it's important that we don't overcomplicate um, what's actually happening with, with integrating renewables. That's the other question we get is the integration question. A, we've integrated manually, uh, which is in a way quite much easier. Um, and B, you can push the envelope, i.e. penetration ratio and how you, you balance your load or even work your power factor on your, on your grid system, but how you use your, your turbines because the power factor is also um, changeable. So you can see what it does just on the one over eight line. And, and in that way, we have been able to really drive our voltage support when we have our lines running underground with large inductive loads. We are able to optimize that system in addition. And in the bottom graph is that point of common coupling grid penetration. Um, I was looking for the 56%, um, but anyway, that's not a bad one either. 45% grid penetration ratio, not to be sneezed at. It's, a, it's good data. The question uh, we get, and this was one of the things Adrian asked me to comment on, is day-to-day -day operations. So if you run an asset like this, what, what's the learning? Um, in our case, we, we have a relationship with, with our supplier. Um, our previous speaker spoke to that. That is a key point, that you keep a relationship on mechanical, electrical inspections. Where have we had issues um, electrically? Um, this thing on pitch control, which really gives you maximum extraction of wind, that pitch control motor is something you should not ignore. Um, and it can also get out of optimum position. You need to reset it, and Enercon helps us make sure our pitch control motor um, is in the right setting so that we have the right blade orientation. Um, electronics suffer in our environment. That was our first year of learning. So, so heating inside the tower at the bottom and the top are, are key for getting our electronics uh, well managed. Um, and on the mechanical side there, the lubrication system, the automatic degreaser has been, has been our challenge and, and we, we now understand it. The last thing on electrically is high voltages on the grid. So we run a 13.8 kV system. When the wind is really howling, we get maximum um, 9.2, 9.4 megawatt, and it's low load conditions, we tend to go into a high voltage situation, so easily into the 14.5, 14.4 kilo, kilovolt scenario. We've got to watch it, and we, we, we actually playing with our power factor uh, processes to get, get some of that down. I don't think <laughs> wind, large scale wind turbines 
are the right solution everywhere. Um, it's, it's understanding what you need to make an installation of this size work, um, which is um, looking at some other parts in Canada, the world, it's not large scale, but for our operation that has a load between 20 and 40 megawatts, it is large scale. Um, you, you need, you, you cannot, they've done wind farm projects or turbines installation in the far north and they failed. And the, the, the bias mentally became wind doesn't work in the north or, no, it is, it does work, but you right, need the right support structure to go with it. Um, in our case, the mining operation is the perfect synergy between um, these type of projects and mining because we already have the earth moving equipment, we already have the electricians and the trades, we have the energy management system, we have the engineers, we have the explosives to blast and build these foundations. We really have the right uh, synergies um, to make sure these assets are looked after, kept reliability uh, up and high and respond to, to issues. I would add, um, it's important to learn very quick. So, uh, especially in the first year, learn as quick as you can. Um, I'm a firm believer of one has to move quite fast on really everything uh, to get maximum value, and, and there is a learning curve. Um, but as it shows in our availability and our kilowatt hour data, that once you've learned, that you can maintain that high profile. I think the learnings for Divic and Rio Tinto have been excellent. Um, I think it's also broken a myth that, or a bias that wind or larger wind is, is not viable. It is, it is quite viable um, as part of a certain risk approach. Uh, there is, I think it's initiated the dialogue on, on wind and renewables in the north, which is quite positive because energy is so expensive and um, we already have a higher risk profile. So whatever it can take us to get our risk profile down as operators in the North is key. Um, our government of the Northwest Territories have taken a keen interest um, in this. And again, I say not pushing renewables for the sake of renewables, it's finding solutions for the North that is quite different than, than many other areas in, in, in the Southern part of Canada. Um, and I didn't put it in there, but the, the community impact is actually quite key. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'm aware that we're sort of catching up on time, so that's why um, we're not taking questions. But 